Hi everyone, uh, this is track four, and today we are presenting Zach Daniel with the introduction to the ASH framework. Zach, the broadcast now belongs to you. Awesome, thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Zach Daniel, and I'm a senior software, software engineer at Variance. I've been working with Elixir for about five years, and for the last year, I've been building an application framework called ASH. ASH is a declarative, resource-oriented application framework and in this talk, we'll be building an application with Ash, talking about what kinds of customizations are offered currently, as well as how we can go about building custom behavior on top of Ash. This talk will assume some familiarity with writing Elixir applications, as well as web applications in general. I'd like to take a moment to thank the team at Variance for their support. Variance is the number one solution for driving software adoption and digital transformation with your remote engineering team. And we're actively looking for engineering teams who are interested in trying our product out. It won't cost you a dime, so check us out at variance.com for more information. Ash is inspired by one of the first systems that I built with Elixir at a company called Albert. Uh, it's deviate, deviated quite a bit at this point from its sort of roots, but the kinds of things that we accomplished using that system and the design patterns that we set down were awesome. We, we all loved it and I've missed it ever since I left. And it's ult what ultimately drove me to build Ash. So that brings us to the Ash doctrine uh, I believe these principles can help us avoid some of the negative aspects of using frameworks, while at the same time empower us to build rich and expressive applications. Configuration over convention means creating a framework that encourages understanding how your application behaves. Declarative over procedural means leveraging declarative design to create smarter systems. There are enormous benefits to building our applications with two main components, a declaration being the what and an engine being the how. It makes it easier to talk about and understand change, easier to write systems that are context aware, and easier to understand what your application does. Extend over customize means not fooling ourselves into thinking that we can write a framework that covers all possible use cases. Instead, we should focus on having a powerful tool chain around extending Ash so that you can leverage the core concepts while writing fully custom applications. And this has the added benefit of enabling a rich ecosystem of extensions. Derive over handwrite allows us to write reliable systems that age well. For example, a vast majority of the documentation for Ash is derived from the same data structures that power the functionality. So this means that a change to that functionality is automatically reflected in the documentation. Before we jump into things, I wanna make it clear that Ash is not production ready. I'm using it in my personal projects and I encourage everyone to jump in and play with it, but it's not ready for the prime time. There's lots of bugs and still lots of work to do. Fair warning for this talk, I'm gonna be moving pretty quickly through lots of code. So don't worry if you don't catch each individual detail. Most of this is documented on hex and whatever isn't documented now will be documented soon. For our example, we'll use a help desk with tickets and users. Our resources will be backed by the Postgres database and we'll start simple and make changes as we get new requirements. So if you're building a web app, the best way to go about that is to add Ash to a Phoenix application. You can see here, I'm using the standard mixphoenix.new generator to create a Phoenix app called Help Desk. And I'm also skipping some components that aren't relevant for our example. The two frameworks are complementary, Ash and Phoenix, especially while Ash is young and can't do everything. But with that said, Phoenix isn't a requirement for the Ash web extensions. You could use plug. Next, we'll add the Ash dependency to our mix.x's file, as well as the Ash Postgres dependency for backing resources with Postgres. To start, We'll place our resources in lib slash helpdesk slash resources. So if this is your application, you know, lib slash my app slash resources. And we'll start simple with just the attributes. We've got a first name, a last name, flags for representative and admin. And as you can see, we've set the ID attribute to be the primary key of the resource. And we also have a default to a randomly generated UUID. Here we've done the same thing for tickets, creating a new resource and adding our attributes. But now that we have another resource, we can add some relationships. And in this case, we have a reporter and a representative relationship, both of which are users. So let's go back to our resource, our user resource and add some relationships to reflect that. Here we've added two relationships on the user resource, one that points at all the tickets that they've reported and another that points at all the tickets that they've been assigned. Next, we'll, configure, we'll add configuration to each resource to describe how it maps to Postgres. First, we configure the data layer of each resource. And by doing so, the Ash Postgres extension adds a new block to the resource DSL for Postgres configuration. We need to configure at minimum the repo and the table. 
The mixphoenix.new generator that we ran automatically created an Ecto repo called helpdesk.repo that we can use out of the box. The user resource will use a user's table and naturally the ticket resource will use the tickets table. And migrations are supported by taking resource snapshots and generating migrations based on the change between those snapshots. This is this support for this is actually still on a branch in Ash Postgres, but it should be done within the next couple of days. And it's important to keep in mind this is an opt-in tool. So you're free to handwrite standard Ecto migrations. And there are a lot of cases where it you know, might be still required or you might still want to. Like if we can't tell if you're trying to rename an application, uh, rename a field or uh, add a field and remove a field, right? So we can't get away from those and we shouldn't want to get away from this sort of standard method of writing migrations with Ecto. Here we call mix ash postgres.gen.migrations and we pass in the API or APIs we want to generate migrations for. So that'll make sense here in a little bit. Uh, then we also can then we call mix ecto.migrate to actually run those migrations. And one last step before we can use our resources is that we need to add some actions. So I've made an action of each type. The first argument to each action is the name, read, uh, I've named them read, create, update, and destroy. So these names can be whatever you want. I'm using these names at the moment because there's nothing special about them. They're just sort of the default implementation of each of those actions. And I've also added those same actions to our tickets resource. So to use them, uh, we have to put them in an API. Resource declarations themselves are static. So they have to go in an API and this module is defined in lib slash helpdesk slash API. So these API modules don't need to be web APIs. They're simply a way to refer to a collection of related resources. And the, they're also the entry point for interacting with those resources, which is kind of a more, a more lower level defini definition of an API. It's not just sort of a JSON API on the internet. And later on, I'll actually show you what a use case for multiple APIs might be. So here we can see that we can use the ash.changeset.new function to create a change set. And if you're familiar with Ecto change sets, uh, ash change sets work very similarly. And here we're making a change set that will create a user with the first name Elixir and the last name Conf. And then we can use the API to create it. So we've passed our change set into helpdesk.api.create. And as you can see, it ran an insert statement in Postgres and returned our newly created user. And we can also call the read function on the API to uh, passing in the resource in this case to get a list of all the users. And we can see that the new user is listed. Alternatively, we could use the get function to get it by its primary key or a unique constraint. And we can also create a query using ash.query and pass that to the read function. So here we've made a query that is for users where their first name is in the list, Zach and Elixir. Going back to the result of our read, we can see that we've created a user with nil for representative and admin, and we'd like to, those to default to false. Additionally, we'd like to make sure that all users provide at minimum a first name or a last <clears throat> or a last name. We should also validate that they both have at least one character if present. So let's go back to our users resource and add those constraints. Here I've added allow nil false to both the admin and representative fields. Additionally, I've set their default values to false. To achieve our requirements that you must have at least one character and first name and last name, we can add constraints to those fields. So each ash type, including custom types, can express constraints. They're custom to each type. So to read more about them, you want to see that individual types documentation. But the string type supports a min length constraint, among others. So we use that here to add our requirement that the first and last name must have at least one character. To express the requirement that at least one of first name and last name must be present, we can use a validation. You can use the built-in validations like present that I show here in this example, or you can write your own. And there's more information on how to do that in the hex documentation. You can see here that we add a validation that says that at least one of first name and last name must be present. And here you can see some examples of making invalid changes and getting errors back. So if we try to make a user with no attributes, it says first and last name, at least one must be present. Uh, and if we try to make it with an empty first name, it says length must be greater than or equal to one, which is what we would expect. Additionally, once we set, uh, once we submit valid changes, you can see that it sets the representative and admin flags to their defaults. Let's add a couple more rules, this time for our tickets resource. See, ticket status can be one of new, investigating, or closed. Additionally, it cannot be nil and defaults to new. Also, a ticket needs a subject that needs to be longer than five characters. And I know what you're thinking at this point. So what? Uh, the resources are clear and they're easy to write, but there's nothing here that we couldn't have done with Ecto. In fact, if this looks so similar to Ecto up till now, 
uh, there's really very little difference. But from here, we're going to start getting into things that are unique to ASH and things that would be difficult without it. So we've got some resources and some rules, and we can use those resources in code. But what about the web API? Let's say for the case of this example, we've got a front end team. They want us to use JSON API, the JSON API specification. Maybe we agree, maybe we'd rather use GraphQL, but we get overruled. Either way, it's been decided we're using JSON API. So there's an ASH extension, ASH extension for JSON API. So let's install it. We can add the ASH JSON API extension to our mix.exes file. And we additionally need to extend our API module. So we can do that by adding the ASH JSON API extension to the list of extensions. Additionally, we need to update the Phoenix router to forward requests to our API. And I want to take a quick aside to introduce the JSON API spec for anyone who isn't familiar with it. It's a specification for building APIs that includes rules about the shape of your data, how related entities are managed and represented, are represented in payloads and responses, and pretty much everything else about how you build your, your API. Um, and even if you aren't familiar with the specification itself, it's very likely that you've used an API or seen an API that follows that spec. So you can see uh, resources in JSON API have a type, they have an ID, they have a list of attributes, and they also have relationships. <clears throat> so even though GraphQL is the current hotness, JSON API is still a very common way to build APIs. Before long here, we're also going to need to know who the current user is, so we can touch briefly on authentication. At the moment, authentication is handled completely outside of Ash. It's up to you to provide an instance of a resource to Ash that is the actor. And if you're using Ash with Phoenix or Plug, there are existing authentication solutions out there already. It is very likely that we'll eventually have authentication extensions for Ash, but it's just not a priority at the moment. For the purpose of this example application, we're just going to fake it. We've put a plug in here that just looks for a user ID request header and sets the actor assigned, uh, which is what the Ash JSON API extension looks for to determine who the current actor is. So we put this plug in our router and we have a way to communicate the current user from the outside world. I'd like to make a note, never do this in a real application. This is not secure in any way. It just lets you be any user that you want, but it is a useful shortcut for the sake of this talk. Soon, we're also going to need some authorization. So we'll go ahead and bring in the standard ASH authorization extension called ASH Policy Authorizer. We'll add that to our mix.exes file, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to use it later. A note here is there's a reason that this is its own extension. It's got quite a bit of code in it, uh, but you can write your own authorizers. And in all likelihood, you're far better off just using, using ASH Policy Authorizer. Uh, but depending on your use case, you may want to roll your own. So let's go ahead and configure our resources for JSON API. So Ash JSON API has a resource extension, which we use to place a given resource in the JSON API. We can use that configuration block to add our configuration. And here we give it a type, which is required by the JSON API spec. We configure its base route. So all of the rest of the routes will start with slash users. And we map some standard JSON API routes to the corresponding resource actions. You can see that get index uh, get and index both use the read action and post, patch, and delete are mapped to create, update, and destroy, respectively. We also say which fields on the resource ought to appear in the JSON API. So as you can see, the JSON API configuration on a resource is just a thin layer on top of the behavior defined in the resource itself. So the entire purpose of this is just mapping the web concepts and the, the things that are isolated to JSON API to a resource that's already capable of sort of serving these actions up. So this is the response from a get request to slash API slash users. And you can see that we've got a functioning JSON API set up for our user resource. It didn't take much work. And this API does actually a whole lot right out of the box. It supports filtering, pagination, and sorting. It supports including related data, as well as filtering and sorting that included data. And I could go into a lot more detail on that, but most of it is defined by the JSON API spec, and we've got more ground to cover. The important thing to note is that the API that it can drive for you off of your resources is very full featured. Let's take a look at creating a ticket via the JSON API. Here, we've made a post request to slash API slash tickets with the payload on the left setting a subject. And on the right, we can see that it successfully created a ticket. It set the default status, as well as the subject that we provided. But thinking about this API, there's a couple problems with it. The action itself isn't very descriptive. We're just making a ticket. But from a domain design perspective, we're opening a ticket. And this action is something we may want to publish events on or track or customize, and having a generic make a ticket endpoint is less desirable than specific customized actions. So let's start by giving it a more descriptive name. 
Here, I've renamed the action itself to open. And additionally, I've updated the route so that our API is more specific as well. And it points at our newly renamed action. So now we can post to slash API slash tickets slash open to open a ticket. The endpoint itself still behaves the same though. And opening a ticket is still missing one pretty big piece. Right now, we don't have, we, we can't include who the reporter of a ticket is with our request. Depending on, on our design or how we intend for people to use our API, we may want the current user to always be marked as the reporter. Alternatively, we may wanna make the reporter part of the input. Perhaps if someday it'll be possible for a user to open a ticket on someone else's behalf. But either way, right now, we only know of the one use case where the current user is the reporter. So let's see what each of these routes might look like. Uh, we'll, we'll, try, we'll try both here. So the first is using an action specific change. Here we've used a built-in change called relate actor. And if there's no actor context, it will mark the changes as invalid. And if there is an actor context, it will relate that current actor via the specified relationship. So this open action, if you use this action, it will relate the current user as the reporter of that ticket. Additionally, we've added a list of accepted changes. So they can only, the only attribute that they can send is subject when they use the open action. And you can actually implement your own changes by creating a module that adopts the appropriate behavior, very similar to how plug works. And in fact, this is how most uh, custom behavior is introduced anywhere in an ASH resource. Uh, but there's more on custom changes and, and, and things like that in the ASH documentation. Uh, but one thing I would like to show is that a, a great way to make this more readable is to define a function that returns the module and options and import that into your resource, like so. And that is actually all that the sort of fancy versions, the built-in versions are doing, is that they are just returning uh, built-in modules with options. So let's try it out in code. First, we'll construct a change set with a change on subject, and we'll pass that into our API call. And here you can see that I've specified a user as well as the action that we want to use in the call to help desk.api.create. So that's how you specify, there's no routes or anything like that in the code API. So that's how you specify your action and you specify the current user. And in the result, uh, just like we wanted, we can see that the user was added as the reporter of the ticket. <clears throat> so next we can try that action out with JSON API, but we wanna make a couple quick changes. In order to see the relationship in JSON API, we'll need to make, uh, we'll need to first add the reporter as a field in the JSON API. And then we wanna make it possible to include the reporter uh, when you make requests against this, against this resource. So here's that same action taken over JSON API. We were able to make a, a more specific request than our API slash tickets, you know, our post to API tickets with a clear intent. And I've trimmed down the response a bit, but as you can see, the reporter relationship has been set and has come back in the included data. So this kind of reusability is great. We can safely expose this action over many interfaces and trust that it follows the same rules everywhere. We used it in code and in our JSON API and it behaved exactly the same. So let's try the alternative approach. Uh, let's say that we expect eventually for a user to be able to register a ticket on behalf of another user, or perhaps we just prefer a more explicit design where we want users of the API to explicitly express that they are the reporter of the ticket. So we can use policies to implement that pattern. First, since we're expecting the client of the API to provide the reporter, and it doesn't make sense to have a ticket without a reporter, we can add that the reporter relationship is required. Additionally, we want to update our open action to accept a reporter. So now they can send subject and reporter. And we'll also add the ASH policy authorizer to our resource, which we do by adding to the list of authorizers. And finally, we can add a policy to prevent from changing the reporter relationship unless you're changing it to yourself. The argument to policy here, we'll break this down a little bit, but the argument to policy here is the condition. This policy only applies when the condition is true. And you can pass a list of conditions as well, and all of them need to be true for a policy to apply. Any policies that apply have to result in an authorized status. In this case, if they're changing the reporter relationship, this policy applies. This is a check type. There are four options, authorize if, authorize unless, forbid if, and forbid unless. So you combine a check type with a check to determine authorization flow. In this case, you'd read the policy as, if they are changing the reporter relationship, they will be authorized if, they are setting the value of that relationship to the current actor. Another thing we'll likely want to add is a bypass, which allows admin users to do whatever they want. A bypass is a policy that if it succeeds, no other checks need to be run, but if it fails, authorization continues on to other policies. So this bypass always applies, 
and it allows an admin user to do whatever they want. It says authorize if actor attribute equals admin true. So this, this, there's no condition on the data or the action or anything. So an admin user can now do whatever they want with this resource. So let's try it out. Here we're calling create with an actor that doesn't match the policies. You can see the actor is user, but he's trying to say that the reporter of the ticket is user two. And the result is a forbidden error. And here you can see that if we use the correct user, this is the actor is user, and it's claiming that the reporter is user as well, then we are allowed to make the change. So now we have a specific informative endpoint called open that accepts a subject and a reporter and only lets us make authorized changes. So next we'll talk about authorizing reads against our ticket resource. First, uh, <clears throat> so I've set the access type to strict, which essentially means that the system must be able to tell before running any queries that you will be allowed to read the results. And generally speaking, strict access is usually a bit too strict but it may make sense depending on your use case. So the policy to break this down here is that if the actor is an admin, they can read a ticket. If an actor is a representative, they can read a ticket. And if an actor is the reporter of the ticket, they can read that ticket. So the individual checks in a policy are run from top to bottom, or rather they operate logically from top to bottom. The authorizer takes a more complica complicated path, more complex path to actually determining authoriz authorization state, uh, but you can read them from top to bottom. So let's try it out. We will try it with a user that is not an admin or representative. So we make a request to slash API slash tickets to get all tickets. And you can see that it actually fails with a forbidden error. So this doesn't work because the system was able to determine that you weren't applying a strict enough filter. If we look back at our policy, it says it has to relate to the actor via reporter, which implies that in order to make this request as a non-admin, non-representative, you have to include a filter over the reporter being yourself. <clears throat> So it actually doesn't need to make any database queries to determine this, uh, except with the exception of the one at the very beginning to fetch your user. Um, so if we add the appropriate user, or sorry, if we add the appropriate filter, it works as expected. We can see that all we had to do was apply that filter and the results were returned. However, this is a pretty bad API. It requires the client to know exactly what filters they need to apply, uh, which is really not a great way to build things. So there are two ways that we can improve this. The first is by using filter templates to make more specific actions or to make actions that are sort of tailored to the current actor. So this one, for example, automatically applies a filter that the reporter of the ticket is the current user. We can then hook that up to our JSON API to make an endpoint specifically for returning your reported tickets. So in this, you can make actions that conform to the policies and you can have nice specific actions that will be authorized. Another way to do it though, is to change the access type from strict to filter. And what you'll likely wanna do is a combination of both of these, of targeted actions to get specific pieces of data, as well as authorization that automatically filters data that you can't see out of the result set. So we can go ahead and make our request now. And this is the SQL query that, ult that it ultimately runs. And you can see that it automatically limited the results. So I've shown a simple example, but this actually works for arbitrarily complex authorization rules with forbid statements and authorize if it, it, it can handle those these large complicated statements. It will add any joins if it has to, it'll use a big nested Boolean statement. So, but what I would like to say here is that ASH policies are not a replacement for building out your own patterns for authorization. Rather, it's a very easy way to interact with the data that backs that pattern. For example, in a system where very fine grained access is required, you may wanna build an ACL, an access control list, or perhaps a system of roles and permissions. And the benefit of ASH is that you can choose your own pattern and describe it using policies. And then ASH will take those policies and lower them to the database. Another note is that individual policies can be configured as runtime policies, which will actually run any required queries and fetch any necessary data to determine the authoriz authorization result. So this means you can use things like external API calls or logic that can't be defined in terms of data or static checks. Ash Policy Authorizer will do its best to push what it can to the database and will do the rest sort of the old fashioned way. <clears throat> We've also got support for calculations and aggregates like sums and counts of related data. And there's still more work to do uh, specifically around calculations and lowering them to the data layer so that they can be filtered and sorted on. However, filtering and sorting is supported for aggregates, which is a very powerful feature. So here's a count aggregate called open ticket count that counts the assigned tickets where their status is not closed. And here is a calculation called full name that is the result of concatenating first name and last name. 
And here you can see an example of how you might request those fields to be loaded using the code API. If you're using JSON API, you would use the, uh, the fields parameter. And so when we load them, we get back a record that has an open ticket count and a full name filled in. If we hadn't loaded anything, we'd see these fields as being explicitly not loaded. You may also have noticed that the aggregates and calculation fields that are on each resource. So when building queries, you can actually provide custom aggregates and calculations. They don't have to be defined on the resource. So in, this is an example of that. Here we're specifying our full name calculation in the query instead of on the resource. And here we've done the same thing with our open ticket count aggregate. So what do we have so far? <clears throat> our tickets resource has a great open action. We've got good authorization for reads against it. We're missing more actions like close and respond, but we're not gonna get to those in this talk. I think you can see how those might be implemented. Uh, but one organizational issue here is that it's all in one top level namespace, which uh, can get pretty messy as the ap application grows. And there's been plenty of talks here today about the main driven design. So I think you know, they would agree with me here. And so I'd like to take a moment to highlight how you might split up an Ash API into contexts. This is an example of how it might be done. Originally, we had one top level API and two resources, but now we've got two contexts each with their own API. We've moved our user resource into an API meant just for account management and signing in. And it, you can use that for storing sensitive information like email, things that shouldn't leak across contexts. And we've also moved our tickets resource into an API meant specifically for ticketing. So we have two resources in the tickets re that represent a user, one for representatives and the other for customers. And we can really lock the user's resource down to ensure that we're never sharing sensitive information. More importantly, by disconnecting our resources from being one-to-one -one with our data, we can achieve very flexible and expressive APIs. The, the goal is not to just map tables to resources. Resources could represent actions. They, you know, the, the entire purpose is to map an interface to some data. In the interest of time, I won't talk you through the entire transition from what we've done so far to this more complex version, but it's important to see that it's possible. And it's also important to see that you can actually route, you can combine them into one sort of larger interface, one larger web API. So here we have uh, both of them being served over the same router. So we built our nice JSON API and someone comes to us and says, we changed our minds. Can you rewrite the API in GraphQL? To which we get to say, why not both? So here's an example of a GraphQL extension configuration for our tickets resource. All we need to do is map the top level queries for fetching and mutating this data to their corresponding actions. And then we can use it in an Absinthe API. The extension will handle the rest from paginating to filtering and sorting. It resolves requests for included data, aggregates and calculations. And it also creates a type that you can use anywhere in your own custom Absinthe API. If you wanna make a resolver that returns a list of tickets, you can do that. So unfortunately, I won't have time to take you through the full setup for Ash GraphQL, but it really only takes a couple minutes. And in the same way that you can plug Ash directly into Phoenix, you can plug Ash directly into an Absinthe API. Although at the moment, sorry, an Absinthe schema. Although I will add that at the moment, you can't use Ash GraphQL without using Absinthe. Uh, we're really just building up a blueprint that Absinthe uses. So we're reaching the end of the talk and there are a lot of things that I couldn't touch on. I couldn't touch on the ETS, amnesia, and CSV data layers that exist, nor how the data layer, pa layer pattern allows for writing custom data layers. In general, you can seamlessly mix uh, different data layers. You can sideload resources from a CSV for another resource in a Postgres database. Um, and I also would have loved to have shown an example of how you might use resources in uh, like a CQRS or dom domain-driven design setup, perhaps with a resource like create ticket that only has a create action and publishes its publishes the result of that action to an event bus. So resources are simply an interface over side effects and data, and you can do things like that. Ash attempts to, additionally, Ash attempts to subvert the standard method of escape hatches by allowing you to build custom extensions and run the control flow yourself. However, there will still need to be a few places with classic escape hatches. The goal of Ash is to be a composable framework. So if you have custom behavior that you need to model, which you will, you can use Ash's extension tooling to easily add new configuration to your resources and then write your code around that. And I've been doing it for a while now, and it's a great design pattern. It's easy to implement, and it's fun to work fun to work with. For the roadmap, we need a lot more tests, fixes, and refactors, and that's just work that needs to be done. The Ash GraphQL integration is currently a prototype at the moment, so there's a lot of work to be done there. I'm looking for contributors. I'm looking for contributors all over the place for all of this stuff. I need help. 
Something that will really supercharge Ash uh, that I'd like to get to is subscriptions. Specifically, we can use the same filter algorithms that we use for authorization to keep queries that power your live views and processes up to date automatically. So you don't need to write custom pub sub code. You can, you can just say like subscribe to this query and keep it up to date. And finally, we'll need to add more customizations to the various extensions to make it more reasonable for people to adopt Ash. I'd like to thank Andrew Callahan especially for coming up with the name Ash and for all of his time and advice. He's been invaluable throughout this process and he's been with me since the beginning. I'd like to thank Mike Bins for a lot of really great contributions that he's made. Uh, he's really improved our CI and our testing story. I'd like to thank Paul Schoenfelder and Jason Goldberger for having lots of long conversations with me to point me in the right direction and, and show me things I never would have thought of myself. And I'd also like to thank the team at Albert IO from a couple of years back, Andrew Summers, Vince Hare, Crescent St. Clair, and per Percy Hatcherson, all of whom were instrumental in sort of developing the initial concepts that one day became Ash. And I'd also like to thank my wife, Meredith Bollinger, for all of her time and support. She really helped me write this slide or make the slideshow. She built the website for ashelixir.org. And so she's been really great. Finally, Ash is huge. I've laid the groundwork, but there's a lot left to be done. So join the community. Visit the community page on our website to book office hours with me personally. You can feel free to reserve some time to throw around ideas or talk about the current state of Ash, or even just tell me why you don't like it. So GitHub issues are the best place to ask questions, make suggestions, or file bug reports. And I've set up a Slack channel and a Google group where we can discuss the next steps and collaborate. Uh, finally, follow us on Twitter to stay up to date on new releases and, uh, and uh, other announcements. Thank you for your time.